Okay, so this is going to be about approximately how it just works. I say approximately because I'm not going to go into detail. I'll go into fairly detail though, so. Okay, so first of all, if you ever use IPFS, you've probably seen this screen. Uh, this is how you add files to IPFS. You just run this command. You get, or, uh, at the very end, you see this thing called a CID. It's a content ID. It points to a file. Uh, you've probably seen it in a path like this, or in a gateway URL. You can then get files by running the get command. Okay, uh, this talk is going to cover how we import files, name files, find files, and then fetch files in the network. When you're importing files, there are a bunch of steps. One is to chunk the file into smaller pieces. One is to then take these pieces and like, actually compile them into files and directories. Um, and then finally, we encode these files and directory objects in a data structure system called IPLD. Uh, then when naming files, we use CIDs, again, content IDs, to actually refer to the pieces of data. Uh, we use paths uh, to describe extra metadata about this, about these like, CIDs or the data we're addressing. Uh, we have another system called IPNS for mutable names. So, uh, cover this bit later, but in IFS, all content is uh, addressed by hash, and that means you can't change the content, so we need a system for actually like pointing to a new piece of content whenever you want to change the content, so we use something called copy right. We'll talk about that a bit. Uh, next, you actually need to find the content, and this involves something called the routing or content routing. Uh, we use a DHT, specifically Cadelia. Uh, finally, you need to fetch it, and for that, we use something called BitSwap. Uh, oh, actually, before I move on, you see these three logos at the bottom. Basically everything on uh, this side, so on your left side of the screen, uh, is IPLD, or it's like, that's like the data structure system we use. Everything on the right side uses libp2p, that's the networking system. Uh, and then at the bottom, that's the multi-formats logo. All these systems use multi-formats that glue themselves together. Uh, I'll point out how these things work while the uh, presentation progresses. Okay, the first thing we do is we chunk the data. So we start with a continuous file, uh, and then we break into small pieces. Uh, we do this for deduplication, uh, to allow for piecewise transfer, and to allow for seeking. Uh, yeah, oh, and also each chunk is hashed. Okay, first of all, deduplication. Uh, when we import a file, we may end up seeing that, hey, like two pieces are the same piece. In this case, the two orange pieces are the same. Uh, with, uh, because we chunk this, uh, files like this, we can actually just not store the second piece and only store uh, the orange piece once. Uh, second of all, piecewise transfer. I can keep on fetching pieces, and then immediately notice that I'm to fetch the entire thing that hey, this piece is bad. So then I can go to the peer and actually find the new copy of the piece, or like the correct piece. Uh, if I just had to like fetch the entire thing, then I fetch the entire thing and realize, oh, this is not the right thing, throw it away. I fetch another entire large file, decide, oh, that's not the right thing, throw it away. In this case, I can get the, like each little piece and like learn early whether or not I'm fetching the right thing. Uh, finally, uh, chunking allows us to seek in a file. Uh, so it means instead of just having to download the entire file to use the piece we want, we can just zip right past the pieces we don't care about and find the piece we want. Okay, uh, Unix FS. So now we have this file and it's been chunked into little pieces, but that doesn't really give us a file system. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is create an actual like, contiguous file out of these pieces that we've just broken up. Uh, for that, we create this thing called the Unix FS file. It's actually, it's a Merkle tree. Um, uh, where you have nodes, they basically say like, well, bytes zero through 20 are on this side, but in this case, uh, bytes, uh, sorry, zero through 200 on this side, uh, zero through, or sorry, 200 to 350 on this side, and then again, uh, zero through 100, 100 through 200, et cetera. Um, uh, a Merkle tree is just a tree of hashes pointing to data, pointing to other uh, data using hashes. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar people are with them, but they've probably used them before if you're working in Ethereum, because that's how Ethereum is built on top of Merkle trees. Uh, I actually lied, but these Merkle trees use something called the Merkle DAG. Uh, it's actually async like graph. So remember how we can like, deduplicate data by chunking? Uh, uh, we don't actually store the tree like this. Instead, uh, we just like store one copy of the orange block, and then like the intermediate, or this one over here, uh, actually points back to the original words block that the uh, original part of the file used. So we don't have to throw twice. Uh, you'll see this dag all over the place. It's a bit confusing to people, but like we do call this out because a tree uh, can't ha like, have two, uh, or, sorry, two pointers and a point to the same thing, or two uh, edges point to the same thing. A dag or a direct graph can't. Okay, 
now that we've created the file, we can actually create a directory. We do this by just mapping file names to files. Uh, again, using hashes or verbal links. So it's pretty straightforward. Finally, we need to actually, okay, so now we've created this logical structure um, using uh, hashes and blobs of data and data structures. We need to actually encode it somehow. Like that I need to be able to actually transfer, or transfer on the network, store it on disk, talk about it, something like that. For that, we use something called IPLD. IPLD is kind of a meta format for understanding and coding markable link data structures. We use it in IPFS, but we also have, like, can use IPLD to understand data in Git and Ethereum uh, because of also Merkle data structures. Uh, basically, IPLD is it's a system for uh, typing or uh, uh, adding a bit of metadata to Merkle link uh, data structures. Like, type them as, like, hey, like, this is a Git tag. This is an IPFS DAG, this is an Ethereum DAG, and like as you use IPLD to like walk these uh, data structures, you remember that, oh, and like this is the tech data structure and this is the context I'm in, so you can like remember how to like find the next piece or understand the, the different pieces. Uh, so just to like, dive in a bit more into what IPLD is, um, the, the name comes from interplanetary linked data. Uh, so if you're familiar with the concept of linked data, uh, it's actually originally named JSON for JSON LD. Um, maybe something before that, I'm not entirely sure what the history is. Uh, but the original concept was to use URLs. Like, you'd have some JSON object, and, and then it could point to some other JSON object using a URL, and then that uh, other JSON object could point to another JSON object using a URL. The problem with this is that URLs uh, have an authority, uh, and that authority, uh, in this case a.com, can change what it points to. We don't want that, but we don't want to trust anyone. Uh, so IPLD uses hashes. Uh, so instead of having a URL, you just say, like, you just Include the hash, and the hash points another object. Uh, it's also immutable because it's hashed. Okay, uh, now we finished up with the internal data structures. We can actually talk about how do we actually name things in the system. So we now have all these like objects that are stored in IPLD, and we need to be able to like, talk about them and pass them around in the network. For this, we use something called CIDs or content identifiers. Uh, you'll see two examples of CIDs there. Uh, the first one is a CID you're probably used to. The second one is the sort of uh, new style of CID that we aren't using very frequently yet, uh, but we'll switch to eventually. Um, we use it for content addressing, uh, that is like addressing content. Um, uh, basically, it's just a hash with a bit of extra metadata. Um, uh, and like, this is how we need every single piece of data in IPFS and IPLD. Okay, uh, first of all, like, why do we use hashes? Uh, or, we use, or why do we use CIDs and hashes? Like, uh, they're verifiable, immutable, and trustless, and permanent. So like, if I have a CID that points to something, it'll always point to the same thing. You might not be able to find it. So this is whenever I say permanent, I don't mean like the data's always gonna be there. I just mean that like, my name for that data is always gonna point to the same data, and like the data can't change. Someone else can't just like replace it and say, oh, this is the thing you wanted? No, like I can tell exactly what I wanted if I got back the correct thing. Uh, so that means like, this is a picture of uh, my cat, Ozzy, and if I ask for it again, I get the same picture. If I ask for it again, I get the like, same picture. I don't get the picture of my other cat. Uh, who's less friendly, but slowly even more friendly. Okay, first thing we're talking about is content addressing versus location addressing. Okay, so content identifiers address content by content, not by where it is. Basically, they address by what it is, not where it is. This is important for IPFS because they could be anywhere on the network and you fetch them from random peers, you don't say trust them. Yeah, uh, but now we'll get into what exactly that is, what the distinction is. Location addressing, I can say my cat, Ozzy, is there. Give someone a map and say, go fetch my cat. Content addressing, this is my cat, find my cat. That's really the difference, where content addressing describes the thing you're looking for, location addressing tells someone where to find it. Okay. Uh, so, but here, what's, what's the problem with location addressing? Well, like, I can say, like, go here and find my cat, but what if you find this cat? You don't know that that's not the right cat, because I told you to find a cat right there. You found the cat, you give me the cat, but you gave me the wrong cat. Uh, unfortunately, you can't do that. So that's why we use like, or content addressing, because like, if I just give you the picture of my cat, then you can look at the picture of the cat, look at the cat, give me the correct cat, and you know that, I, that you're actually giving me the correct cat. Second digression, a bit of metadata. Uh, this one, uh, we will skip through pretty quickly because it's, it has a lot of details. Uh, this is multi-formats. Uh, so remember how I said that a CID, a content identifier, is a hash plus a bit of metadata? Um, this is actually more going to discuss that a bit. Uh, first of all, we have two types of CIDs. We have CIDV0, CIDV1. We don't have to get too much into this, but basically, CIDV0 is the old form of CID, so the one we actually use most 
scrutiny at the moment. CADV1 is the new format of CID. It has even more metadata because we realized we didn't have enough in CADV0. CADV0 has only one piece of metadata, and that, that is, uh, well, sorry, CADV0 is a multi hash. We'll stick with that for now. Uh, a multi hash is just a special hash, or like a special type of hash that we use. Uh, that includes the hash digest and uh, something called multi codec that uh, indicates the type of hash we use to produce that hash digest. Uh, CIDV1 uh, is a multi base encoded IPLB format multi hash tuple. Get that. Okay. Uh, first of all, I actually just covered this. Multi hash is a self describing hash digest. Basically, uh, I give you the hash digest like an MD5 output, or actually, we don't use that. So, shot 6 output, uh, and then like uh, a number, uh, in this case, it's a multi codec to indicate which function we used. This way, like I can decide to use SHA-3 or Kasha, or actually it's the same thing, uh, SHA-3 or uh, um, SHA-1 if I really want to in the future. Uh, and uh, like, I, like, you'll know which one I'm using because I include it in the hash itself. Uh, but here I talked about something called a multi-codec that I didn't really explain. Let's get into that. A multi-codec is a non-magic number. So uh, computer science often operates on these magic numbers that like are used to indicate various things, or various file types. Like um, if you ever, or, sorry, if you ever tried to like figure out what type of file something is on your disk, uh, like Windows uses extensions, but actually like Mac OS and Linux, they use single magic numbers uh, where they'll just like read the first few bytes of the file and see if like the byte, if the first few bytes match some known prefix for some for the file. Unfortunately, there's no, like, sorry, there are tables of these, but they aren't like decided ahead of time. They're just like sort of random, or people just hope that these matching numbers don't conflict with each other. Um, and like, a lot of times it's just like a lot of guessing involved, basically. Um, multi codec is trying to avoid this, where basically we've created this massive table of non magic numbers that we are pre allocating and like uh, keeping track of. So, that, like, basically, for every single concept we have, we can just assign it a number. So in our case, like we have uh, like numbers for multi hashes for multi adder or addressing system. Uh, we have uh, codecs for the, our serialization formats. Everything. So basically, whenever we come up with some new concept that we want to like give a short name to, we just create a number, stick it in the table, we're done. Okay. Uh, final little piece here: multi base. Uh, I will try not to get too deep into this. Um, uh, so basically. If we go back to CIDP0, if you look at CIDP0, it always starts with QM something, something, something. You also notice that we have capitals and lowercase there. This does not play well with browsers. Um, uh, and we realize that actually, you know what, in certain contexts, we'll need to use one base encoding. In other contexts, we need to use another base encoding. But we need to actually be able to tell which base encoding we're using. So this is where multi base came in. Um, kind of like with multi hash and all these other formats, or all the multi formats, we use a prefix to tell you what type of base encoding we're using. So in this case, if you see a B up front of something, you'll know it is uh, encoded using base 32. If you see a Z, you'll know it's encoded using base 58. If you see an F, you'll know it's encoded using base uh, 16. You also may notice that like, B is a valid uh, uh, character in base 32, Z is a valid character in base 58, and F is a valid character in base 16. Um, so basically, these are just self-describing uh, base encoded strings. Okay, actually, this is the final one. Finally, IPLD. Uh, let's see. Uh, so remember in um, CADV1, how I said that it's a multi base encoded, again, how we use the multi base prefix and then some base encoded thing, um, tuple of uh, an IPLD format and a multi hash. Uh, the IPLD format tells us how we encoded the data that we point to. So the multi hash tells us like which data we're talking about, it's, it's hash of the content. The IBLD format part of this tells us like how to understand the data we are pointing to. Uh, that's it. Uh, so uh, we have uh, one for Seymour objects, one for Git objects, one for Ethereum blocks, Ethereum transactions, IPLS files, all these different formats. OK, that was a lot of uh, details. If you fell asleep, please wake back up. We can now move on. Uh, the only reason I brought that up is like those are a lot of really cool projects that you should look at, but I don't really have time to fully explain. Okay, uh, paths. So you may have noticed that IFS uses paths, we don't use URLs. Most projects would say like something colon slash slash something else or something colon something else. Um, we don't do that because 
uh, like URLs, paths are namespace, but unlike URLs, paths are recursive. Uh, so you'll notice uh, that on the right-hand side, uh, uh, we have slash dns, slash github.com, slash tcp, slash uh, port number, slash ssh, slash git. This is a way to describe a git URL for a piece of content. Uh, the second version is how you actually describe this like, normally using a URL. But in this case, you have to use kind of a hack. Like, you actually have to say git plus ssh, because you can't compose multiple protocols. That path lets us actually compose these protocols. So this is why we use paths. Uh, this has been a very contentious issue, this is why I bring it up. But we use them because like, we want to be able to like, embed protocol with the protocol with the protocol, run protocol for protocol for protocol. But to do this with a URL, you have to like, create these long strings of like x plus y plus z, and then like, have basically have a specific format for every single combination of protocols. Okay, the final part of uh, naming is IPNS. This is actually our naming system. Uh, IPNS stands for the Interplanetary Name System. Uh, it's uh, very imaginative. Uh, so IPNS uh, allows you to map a public key to a path. Uh, and then to, the way this works is you basically take the, the, your, like, the path you're trying to map it to, and you take your public key and your private key, and then you use your, your private key to sign the path you're pointing to, and you just publish the world and tell the world, hey, this is like, this is the, the path that this public key currently wants to. Uh, then if you want to update it, so I can just, you know, if you want to update it, you just sign a new record and release it. You actually put an additional sequence number saying like, this is version two, you do it again, you say this is version three, version four, et cetera. Uh, finally, IPNS can actually point to arbitrary paths. So I can use IPNS to point to IPNS. I can, in theory, use it to point to swarm. I could use it to point to really any path I want. So it's not system specific, it's just a general purpose tool. Uh, if you've ever used or tried to use IPNS and you said it's slow, this doesn't work, I'm sorry, uh, this is actually a problem with the DHT. Uh, it's a system we currently use for resolving IPNS paths we're working on improving that. It's not an inherent issue in IPNS itself. Okay, now we've covered how to import files, how to name files. Uh, finally, we get to talk about like, the other side of the equation. Uh, now I'm trying to actually find a file and then download it. So first of all, how do I find a file? Well, we use this thing, this thing called routing or content routing. Basically. We take a CID and then we have to turn it into a location address. So we talked all about how like, we don't want to use location addresses. Well, that's not actually true. We actually have to use the location address to actually find the content, but we start with a content address and then use a routing system to do a bunch of work to actually find out the set of people that currently have the content we're looking for, the set of peers that currently have the content. So, but because we're using content addresses, it means that this set can change. It also means we don't have to trust the peers. So we'll find a set of people that claim to have a file, and they'll pass them to the file, and then we can verify that they gave us back the right file. Okay, so how do we actually do this? Well, we keep writing it. It's quite simple. Um, we just have a massive table of, uh, like, this peer has this thing, this peer has this thing, or actually this thing is held by this set of peers, this thing is held by this set of peers. So if I'm trying to find, in this case, QM bar, that's just the fake CID, I go to this writing table and say, okay, who has it? And it says, Izzy. Izzy is my account. Uh, there's a bit of a problem with this, though. The routing table is really big. Uh, a single peer can't easily hold this routing table. Well, maybe at the moment they could, but in the future they won't be able to do that. Um, so we have to figure out like, how do we deal with this massive routing table and like, where do we actually store it? To do that, we're using like, all the distributed hash table. And, as the name implies, you take the, the routing table and you distribute it amongst all the peers and networks. Uh, so instead of having like everyone know who has what, you have, in this case, like, Ozzy, one of my cats, know who has some of the content, Izzy, my other cat, know who has other pieces of content. But there's a little problem here. How do you know who is what piece of the routing table? So like, yes, I can take this routing table, I can break it into pieces and give it out to a bunch of people, but now like you have the same problem where you don't know where to go and who to ask Sorry, before you didn't know who to ask for the content, now you don't know who to ask for the piece of the routing table, you need to find the piece of error of the content. Um, so we solve this using Kademlia. Uh, this is pretty common um, in distributed systems, or sorry, decentralized systems. Uh, Kademlia is definitely by far the most common uh, distributed hash table. Um, and basically the solution is you determine the distributed routing table. So the is like giving out one piece to one person, one piece to another person, one piece to another person. You like, you uh, basically based on the routing record, like. Uh, based on the piece of content that you're uh, trying to remember. So you're trying to remember who has what piece of content. Um, based on the content that uh, like some peer has, you find the peer that's responsible for remembering who has that content, and you tell that peer who has that content. That's basically what we do. 
Uh, I'm gonna rewind that one because that doesn't make sense. Okay, so uh, like you have some piece of content, Q and Foo. Um, you find the peer that's responsible for remembering who has Q and Foo, and you tell them I have Q and Foo. Then if you're trying to find Q and Foo, uh, you find the peer responsible for remembering who has Q and Foo, and then you ask them who has Q and Foo, and they tell you like someone or usually a lot of people. Okay, now we're not gonna get too far into how Canva works because it's a bit complicated and you can read the paper, but I'm gonna give a quick overview of the general idea. Canva uh, is based on uh, two key features, a distance metric and a query algorithm. Uh, first of all, the distance metric basically just lets you say like, is this peer closer or is this peer closer to some piece of content? So you have some piece of content C, and you have peer X and Y, tells you which peer is closer to the content. The second piece of uh, KidMLEO is the query algorithm. Uh, the query algorithm uh, allows you to use the distance metric to get to the peers that are closest to the content. Uh, uh, basically, like it's kind of like having a compass that uh, points to the content, and then algorithm tells you how to walk to the content. That's basically what KidMLEO is. Specifically, uh, it uses a distance metric XOR of uh, the hash of the content and the hash of the peer. You don't have to really understand this or look into it too much, but effectively each of the number um, that it based something called the triangle of quality. <coughs> uh, the next piece is the query algorithm, which is quite simple. You ask the closest peers to the content you know about, which peers are closer, and they give you a set of peers that are closer. Now you know closer peers to the content, and you go ask them, and you keep on doing this. Uh, Kidomi had actually this neat property where like, everyone remembers like peers that are next to them, and then peers that are like, Half or like halfway further, then halfway further again, and halfway further again. Uh, the, the cool thing about this, uh, this is called gratitude. The cool thing about this is like that means like when I'm trying to find content, I can always get halfway closer each time. So like the first hop, I'll go probably across the network to find peers that are halfway closer. The next time, or the, those peers will, will tell me about peers that are again halfway closer. Then the peers that like those next peers will tell me again about peers that are halfway closer again and again and again. Um, if you want to learn more about this, I highly suggest you read the paper. If you Google Demley a paper, you will find it. Uh, yeah. Okay, final part, five minutes. Okay, this is actually on time. Bit swap. Bit swap is how we actually fetch data. Uh, yeah, so we've covered like, how do we actually take the data and put it into IPFS, how do we talk about the data in IPFS, name it, how do we find the data, and how do we actually like, ask peers for the data and use it? Get it. Uh, we use like, open swap. So the way that swap works is using want lists. Uh, the want list is literally just a list of things you want. Uh, so in this case, one of my cats, Izzy, um, wants Q and personal space, Q and per. Um, one of my cats, uh, my other cat, Ozzy, wants uh, cuddles, blood, and food. Um, I say blood because he tends to, you know, scratch a bit. Um, uh, and what they do is that they, they, they go by this list and they tell everyone else about the list that are the things they want. Or sorry, all their connected peers about the things they want. Uh, and that is the step. So now they've swapped their want lists. Uh, now, Izzy determines uh, what she has. Ozzy determines what he has. Um, Izzy realizes, or Izzy has blood, uh, food, the food she's trying to eat that Ozzy is now stealing. Um, uh, Ozzy has, or Ozzy will purr. Uh, and so then they send these files, these pieces of the files to each other. Then they cross these off their one list. One interesting property about this is you don't actually like, it's not a request-based system. You don't ask for something and then get a response back. It's like you tell someone else what you're looking for, and then eventually they may give it back to you. So, Ozzy, or sorry, Izzy will actually remember that Ozzy still wants cuddles. So, in the future, maybe she should become more cuddly, which is slowly happening. Um, Izzy may finally give Ozzy cuddles. But for now, she doesn't have cuddles, so she's not going to give it to him. Uh, same with Ozzy. Ozzy may eventually decide that giving people personal space is a good idea, uh, in which case, the Ozzy will actually like, send personal space over. Uh, so that was a bit swap. Uh, now we've gone through again, importing the files, naming them, finding them, and then finally we fetch some bit swap, and then we can just spit them back out. That was how IFS works. So, any questions? Very fast. Yeah, so I
Okay, so graph sync. Uh, you see in the last section bit swap, graph sync goes right below that. Um, graph sync is the next protocol for fetching data. So bit swap, um, like with bit swap, like I, I tell you the set, th set things I want, and you tell me the set things you want. With graph sync, um, I give you a description of the subset of some Merkle DAG or Merkle tree that I want, and you give them back, you give them back to them all once. Um, so, the problem with this all is like if I'm trying to like walk down a directory tree, I would have to ask you for this piece. You'd give me this piece. Then I'd say, oh, actually, I want the last block, so or I want a block in the byte range 250. So I would ask you for this piece. You'd give it back to me, and then say, oh, I want this last piece. So I'd ask for this piece, and you give it back to me. Unfortunately, this means I have to do one round trip for this, one round trip for this, and then one round trip for this, and it's going to be really slow on the network. With graph sync, I can actually just describe this entire process to you all at once, where I can just say, hey, I want the last block of this file. Or what I'm actually doing here is I recursively say, like, uh, I want the last link of this uh, node in this uh, Merkle tree, and then the last link of its child, last link of its child, until finally you get to the, uh, to the, the final child. That's what graph sync is. Next question. Graph sync work for uh, parallelization. Of ah, okay. So how does graph sync work for like for parallelizing fetching multiple peers? Yep. Okay. At the moment, uh, it, the current implementation doesn't. Uh, it just like you tell it fetch from this one peer. In theory, the way this will work is like you start asking for one peer for uh, sorry, start asking one peer for some like subset of a DAG, and then you can like send them an updated query saying actually I don't really care about the subset, and then you go and send that uh, query for that subset to another peer. Um, this is a bit complicated. Uh, so the next step in implementing graph sync will be uh, like combining pieces of bit swap with pieces of graph sync to make like a system that can intelligently choose which peers they ask which pieces from. Out of time, but no questions. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Richard.